Good evening, everyone. It's really, really lovely to see everybody here, in spite of all of the difficulties that we're all experiencing in London, in the UK, all around the world. I really, really appreciate you being here and it means a lot to me. You were probably expecting two chairs and two people on stage and until a couple of days ago, so did I. Um, but um, the moderator, Molly Flynn, was not able to join me today because of the pandemic. Um, and I decided that some people are irreplaceable in some circumstances. So I decided not to replace her and to have this conversation with you and me. And I think we can manage that. I think we'll be fine. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the book that we've come to discuss today. I'll read a little bit from the book as well and I'll take your questions, comments and reflections at the end if you have any. And then we can continue having a glass of wine later on if that's all right, if you can still stay. Um, oh yes, and you can purchase the books <laughs> if you want to uh, from, uh, from the wonderful Louis over there. Um, this space is really, really meaningful to me. Um, we performed here, All That Remains, um, with Molody Theatre London, my theatre company. The actors are here. Hello, actors. Yay. Some of them anyway, not one of them, but some of them are here. Um, and that play really was um, the first step towards this book, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, but, I, but I know it now. It was the first attempt for me to begin to articulate um, my trauma, my loss, uh, the loss of my brother uh, at the front line. So my brother Volodya um, would have turned 47 10 days ago, uh, but he will stay 42 forever because in 2017 he was uh, killed uh, by shrapnel at the front line uh, in, near Popasna in Luhansk region uh, after serving uh, for nearly two years in the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, listening to news reports over the last couple of weeks um, was quite challenging, I must admit, uh, because a lot of the reports talked about um, the imminent or potential invasion uh, of Ukraine by Russia. When in fact, as we all know, um, the Russian aggression started in eastern Ukraine nearly eight years ago. And since then, nearly two million people have been internally displaced and 14,000 people lost their lives. And my brother's life was one of those lost. Um, of course, people in Ukraine are very anxious and fearful of the potential escalation. Uh, but it's also important to bear in mind that after nearly eight years, uh, people are used to the war being part of their daily lives. Um, eight years is twice as long as the First World War, right? So that's, that's kind of a sobering thought if we think that, you know, the war in Eastern Ukraine has been going on for twice as long as the First World War. Um, and obviously you get accustomed to everything to do with that, to violence, to explosions, to shelling, to danger. Um, there's a really interesting episode in um, uh, Natalia Vorozhbyt's play and also film Bad Roads uh, when uh, a young woman is in, in, uh, comes back from evacuation and talks to her friends and she says, gosh, I miss being back. Well, she comes back to her hometown and she says, I miss being back in my hometown. I was walking along the street and I could hear the explosions and I thought, oh, I'm at home. Uh, and the fact that the sound of explosion can be the sound of home is very disturbing. Um, and so in order not to allow violence, um, perpetual life in, with grief and trauma to be normalized, to become the daily um, sort of occurrence, the, 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 the daily life uh, of Ukrainians, I think it's very important that we talk about these things and um, we talk about them in Ukraine, but also outside of Ukraine. And that's what I'm planning to do today. And that's what I'm hoping to do with this book. Okay, so I'll um, read a little bit to you now from the book. And the first passage I'd like to read tonight is a chapter about our performance of All That Remains. And the second half of the chapter is set in this very theater. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's a very special place for me to read that chapter to you. And as I read the text, I'll also pass around a couple of things uh, for you to look at. So
So one is this absolutely gorgeous illustration by Hanna Strisch, one of several illustrations that ended up in the book. Um, and this one illustrates um, the chapter I'm about to read. So there's a, a woman on stage. Um, I'll pass it uh, that way and then you can pass it on um, at the back row to come back here. And I'll also uh, pass around a couple of shots from the play. Um, it'll probably make more sense when you listen to it, but have a look at them and uh, yeah, um, this is just to help you visualize some of the stuff that I'll be talking about. So I'll give to here. Oh gosh, I feel like in a classroom. Please take one and pass around. <laughs> All right, um, and the chapter is called Theatre of War. Never before had I been so frightened of looking people in the eye. I couldn't breathe. Why the hell did I start this project? Why did I think it was a good idea? I wanted to cry, to run away, to lock myself in the dressing room and tell everyone that everything was cancelled. But it was too late. The deposit for the theatre had been paid, we had invested so much time into rehearsals, and in any case, people had already started to arrive at the small London theatre for the first night's performance. They had paid for their tickets. The first two performances were sold out and there was even a long waiting list. All these people had chosen to spend an hour of their precious time watching our show. I had to pull myself together and face them, my hands trembling, my eyes welling up, my voice breaking. I stood in the entrance to the auditorium watching them come in one by one. When I felt that I was losing my grip, I would step into the darkness of the dressing room, um, all the actors were on stage already, and say a sort of prayer. I wasn't sure if I was, who it was addressed to. Was I pleading with the divine power to help me do this show well, or begging my brother's forgiveness for using his story in a theatre piece and asking him to hold my hand on stage, to help ensure that those who came to see it understood at least some of what I was trying to convey to them. The prayer gave some sort of comfort and I could step out to greet the audience. Some entered with a pint of beer or a glass of wine, some with, with a supportive smile or a hug. They sat down. The pre-show chatter stopped. The house lights were still on. I made eye contact with my actors and the technician to let them know that we were about to start. I stood center stage, waiting for my nerves to come down. I saw my mother, my father, my brother. All three of them looked back at me from the audience just as nervously as I was looking at them from the stage. Deep breath. Okay, I had to start speaking. I don't like talking about what happened. What happened is still how I refer to it most of the time, and I really don't like talking about it. We started the show. The opening line was hard to utter. It had also been the hardest to write. The theatre company had agonised over it collectively with me, how does one start a play about a death on the front line? You can whack the audience with a hammer of graphic description of horrors of war and make them regret that they booked that ticket right away. You can also be too delicate and leave them feeling nothing. This was a play about a brutal war. I didn't want the audience leaving as if nothing had happened. I don't like talking about what happened. It seemed like a good opening line. More importantly, it was true. I hated talking about it, and I tried not to unless I absolutely had to. My family's lives were permanently split into a before it happened and an after it happened. When did you speak to so-and-so last? My mother would ask my brother. Oh, it was a while ago, before, you know, before what happened. Others around us were using it too. A friend would ask, has your mother been to Ukraine since, you know, since what happened? A, use, a euphemism has its role and power. So I used it as a gentle opening into a less gentle story of a life lost at the front line. People seem to be listening. The actors were delivering their lines, the scenes changed one after another, 
The chaos of social security office turned into a therapy room for a woman suffering from PTSD. A frontline trench then turned into a friend's kitchen. Then a graveyard. And then back into a theater stage. It was all a blur for me. I regained awareness of reality when the show was over. People came up and gave me a hug. Some were sobbing. I was moved and reassured about the next step, taking the play to the biggest theater festival in the world, the Edinburgh Fringe. The experience of Edinburgh was sobering. Walking up and down the Royal Mile, the city's busiest street, approaching tourists who wanted to hear jokes about politics, was not new to any of us. This was the third show we had brought to the Fringe, but the previous two were comedies, albeit pretty dark. Now we had five seconds to get each passerby interested with a flyer and a catchphrase about a war show. I found myself struggling to say to strangers, this is a true story, it's about my brother. My pain was still very private. I was, it was hard enough displaying it in control space of a, of a small theater, never mind on a busy street. I hadn't thought of this when making the Edinburgh preparations, nor had I, had I thought of um, what performing every day for a week, sometimes two shows per day, would do to my morning process. I just had a compulsion to perform this play to as many people as I could. By the end of the run, I was exhausted, and so was the rest of the company. Not only did they work really hard, giving out flyers by day, performing by night, they were also checking up on me, making sure I was okay. By the end of the run, I knew I could go anywhere with them, even to the depths of grief. And that is where we went next. We decided to keep performing the show in theatres in London, but felt we wanted to develop it further. The major change came when one of the actors had to leave and we needed to replace him. He had been performing the part of my brother. His lines came from the videos that my brother had recorded on the front line. I found them in Volodya's phone. I don't know who they were made for or why. Perhaps he made them in the hours of desperate loneliness when a phone camera was the only channel through which to converse with the rest of the world. The first one recorded a sunset through a hole in a dugout wall. The, the second depicted a frozen lake and a snowy landscape. The last one showed the scenery around the trench covered entirely by a thick fog. It ended with a close-up of the sparkling drops of rain on a bare branch. It was recorded just a couple of days before his death. I had wanted to incorporate the videos into the show but hadn't had the courage to play them on stage. So I had transcribed and translated the text and had it delivered by an actor. To give him a soldiery look, I went online once again and bought a uniform and army boots. Facebook, of course, started to advertise all these items to me again, just like the first time when I bought them for my brother. Sometimes I found it amusing, sometimes insufferable. Now that actor had left and, we had, and all we had um, were the uniform and the boots, I decided not to replace the actor, but to use my brother's actual videos in the show. I seem to have found the courage to do that now. The first performance using my brother's videos, here, felt like we were doing it all for the first time again. I had a similar sense of trepidation, but this time not so much because I had to face an audience, but because I was about to face my brother, albeit on a screen. The small theater was packed full. We started the show as we had done many times before, but this time, soon after the opening scene, two actors unfurled the sheet of white fabric. I picked up a handheld camera, a projector, knelt down in front of, in the middle of the stage so as not to block the screen, selected the first video and played it for all to see. A blood red sun appeared through the piles of earth and my brother's voice narrated the scene. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? I present you with a sunrise through a hole in a dugout wall. Of course you won't see what I see here, it's not the same on video. See those hills over there? That's where the enemy is. We're fighting them, see? Anyway, I better take my phone away because they can shoot right fucking at it. 
the video finished. The actors folded the screen. And I could not believe that my brother and I had just met face to face. I wasn't the only one who felt that way. My mother came to see every show. And when people asked her why she did that, she said that she came for the encounter with her son. Neither of us could bring ourselves to watch those videos at home anymore, but we did it with certain joy when they were played on stage. The inclusion of the videos changed the experience of the show completely for me. Kneeling there, looking at my brother on the screen, sometimes I cried and sometimes laughed. Hello everyone, this is our position in the forest. Look how pretty it is. Fuck me, winter, started the second video. All you could see was dirty white snow all around. Beautiful indeed. Down there, there's a lake. Over there, there's, down there, there's a village. Over there, there's a lake. Yeah, it's a fucking lake, all right. That phrase and my brother's deadpan delivery always made me giggle. He continued. Over there, we take cover from all sorts of mines and motor fire. I really like it when winters are beautiful like this. Profound and profane. That was Volodya in a nutshell. And then he hummed a song. I ain't got no honey baby now. I ain't got no sugar baby now. I didn't recognize that song, so I looked it up. It turned out to be an old blues. The second verse went, who'll rock that cradle? Who'll sing that song? Who'll rock that cradle when I'm gone? The line from the recordings that was forever engraved into my memory came at the very end of the last video. After showing his bulletproof vest, radio transmitter, communications, optics and all that shit, my brother zoomed in on the branches of a bush growing right outside of the trench and said, but the most interesting thing here are those drops of rain on the branches. See these droplets? That is the most interesting thing here. Two days later, he was killed in that very trench. I can only hope that he saw the sparkling droplets against the sky as he waited for the moment of complete peace. I'll rock that cradle. I'll sing that song. I'll rock that cradle when you're gone. Exit. Curtain. That's when you do need the moderator <laughs> to say something while I recover. <laughs> well, thank you for listening so patiently. So that's the story of the play, uh, All That Remains. Um, and it really allowed me to talk through um, my trauma uh, in a very safe environment with actors who are my friends, because most of the lines were delivered not by me, but by the actors. So I could essentially watch my experience be played out in front of me, which um, was a very useful thing to go through. Um, but what I also quite quickly realized that a lot remained unsaid um, about that experience of losing my brother and coming to terms with what's happening in Ukraine in this strange war in the middle of Europe that nobody expected. I knew that one way to deal with this, these mixed emotions was to write. Um, it turns out that one can learn many things from obituaries, even things that hadn't happened. Those were, of course, the most interesting passages. People who write obituaries must feel the pressure to make the subjects of their texts as inspiring and important as possible. But let's face it, few of us are particularly inspiring and even fewer are important. So their only choice is to make things up, to embellish. Obituaries, for those who have died on the battlefield, seem to follow the same template. The first paragraph gives basic facts. So-and-so served in such and such unit, was of such and such age when he or she died in such and such place while fulfilling his or her duty to defend the homeland. The second paragraph is about how human the fallen soldier was. It's supposed to get us to identify with him or her. It could be a quote from a relative or a friend. He was a talented artist. She had three little children. It's usually the kids that are emphasized when a woman dies, not her occupation or her military accomplishments. He loved his native city. That was a line in most of my brother's obituaries. It's true. 
Volodya genuinely loved Lviv. He couldn't understand why I didn't want to move back. I explained that I felt like I had grown out of it, like one grows out of one's favorite childhood clothes. You still love them and you don't want to give them up, but you can't wear them anymore. I explained that the Lviv of our childhood was not the Lviv of today. He saw it differently. I guess for him Lviv was whatever he made, he made of it in his imagination. Like me, my brother lived for many years away from Lviv, mostly in the Netherlands. But for some reason, the obituaries wrote that he had lived in Belgium. It only takes the first reporter making a mistake for all the others to reprint it. Fact-checking didn't seem to be terribly important for those obituary writers. So they moved my brother from the Netherlands to Belgium. But what difference does it make if it is one wealthy West European country or another? To most people reading these obituaries, Belgium or the Netherlands stood for the same thing, the West. Prosperous life, no war, and no need to go to war. Western Europe was a perfect setting for the third paragraph, the one about the heroic decision to go to the front. You need to have something to leave behind in order for your decision to join the army to be heroic. If you have nothing of value to leave, little kids, a fancy job, cozy life in Western Europe, then you have nothing of value to lose, apart from your life, but its value is dubious. You may as well go to the front, nothing heroic about that. So the third paragraph in my brother's obituary ran as follows. For a lengthy period of time he lived abroad, in England and Belgium. Although he had a good job abroad, he was not afraid to return to his homeland to fight in the East as soon as he could, because every one of us should take responsibility for the future of our country, or something along those lines. Now, pathos aside, this would be a fitting paragraph for an obituary. The only problem with it was that almost none of it was accurate. First, as we already established, he lived in the Netherlands. He visited the UK twice, and I don't even know if he's ever been to Belgium. Second, he didn't have a good job um, in the West. Few immigrants do, especially those from poorer countries like Ukraine. Unless your concept of a good job is getting a minimum wage on a precarious contract because there's always a queue of other immigrants ready to replace you, cycling 12 mile, miles to work because you want to save on travel, and regularly hearing xenophobic abuse from your employer because, well, I don't know why people feel compelled to say xenophobic things to immigrants who are actually working for them, but they do. But if you leave a job like that, or if, God forbid, you don't have any job at all before you sign up for army service, or if, an even more frightening thought, you join up because you don't have a job and army service is a way of earning a living, that's not going to look good in your obituary. The third, and perhaps the most frustrating inaccuracy, was that he hadn't returned to defend his homeland. He may well have done this if he had still been living abroad when the war started, but he had returned a few years earlier. Why? Why do many immigrants come back? Because they get fed up with the life of an immigrant, who never fits in, never fully belongs. They get fed up of their names never seeming to come out right when said by the locals, even those who try hard, even those who say it with love. Because nothing holds many immigrants abroad. Because while they are away, they imagine the country of their youth to be exactly what they want it to be, regardless of what it actually is. Because of millions of very ordinary reasons that have nothing to do with defense of the homeland or heroism. And finally, he hadn't signed up as soon as the war began. For some reason, his draft notice did not arrive, although he had been expecting it to. Expecting it to. He thought about his decision for a while, which is only a reasonable thing to do when the decision has a potentially lethal outcome, and eventually signed up to go to the front voluntarily. He put on his old army uniform on, the one he had worn when served as a conscript in the 1990s and kept as a souvenir, turned up to the local military recruitment office, the same one where he had been drafted as a young man, and reported that he wished to go to the front line. I learned all this from the people in the military commissariat much later. My brother seemed to have made quite an impression on them. They all remembered the scene and related to my mother and me enthusiastically when we came to collect the order for bravery that he had been awarded posthumously. So there you have it. 
one short paragraph and at least four inaccuracies. The obituaries painted a very unambiguous picture of a successful man in his prime who dropped everything and rushed to give up his life for his native land. I guess I should have felt proud reading it. The only problem was that I didn't recognize my brother in this description. It's not that he wasn't brave or that he didn't care about his homeland. He was, and he did. It's just that things were much more prosaic. And if, he didn't, if I didn't recognize him in this description, if he didn't live up to it or didn't die up to it, did that mean that I was not to feel proud of the real him because his actual story didn't fit the heroic template? Oh yes, the template. There's usually some room for a description of a heroic death because the loss of a soldier's life has to be described as heroic. Not as a tragic mistake, and an accident, a disaster, but as an act of selfless heroism. The thing is, there's often little that is heroic about dying at the front line. My brother's friend, the last person to talk to him on the phone just moments before he died, said that the last thing he heard him say was suka, blad, which can roughly be translated as shit, fuck. They were planning my brother's leave, which was coming up in a couple of days, and then he heard some blasts in the background and my brother shouting, Suka, blad. And then the connection was lost. Not something for an obituary, right? Something for life, something for death, but not for an obituary. As I read my brother's obituaries, I wondered, if reality doesn't make it into obituaries, then what does? These inaccuracies might seem like innocent embellishments, a journalistic trick to make ordinary people seem a little bit extraordinary. But why is an uninteresting and unimportant life lost in the one not deserving of a mention in the news? And in any case, whose life do we consider to be valuable and who's expendable to the point that it's not worthy of an obituary? As lives are lost in the war in eastern Ukraine, all that is left of them is memory. But what sort of memory do we create for them with our white little lies? As I read my brother's obituaries, I wondered whether the journalists who wrote them appreciated that another serviceman or servicewoman reading an embellished text and realizing that his or her life was not like the one described there might think himself or herself worthless. Whether they gave any thought to what it might be like for relatives to read an obituary and not really recognize their loved one behind the embellishments. It doesn't help in the process of grieving. As I read my brother's obituaries, I dreaded to even think what would be written in my own. But I haven't left my life in Western Europe to defend my homeland. So perhaps I wouldn't be deemed worthy of an obituary at all. Perhaps it's just as well. Just, I guess I just wanted to say I didn't plan to publish this book. Um, like I said, I was writing, writing to get these kind of feelings and thoughts out of my system. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but I had no intention to publish it. Um, what gave me the courage to send the manuscript to the publishers was the realization of my privilege. So m very few people uh, of those 14,000 um, people that I mentioned that lost their lives, very few relatives of those people have the chance to write, to speak and to do so in English. Um, and I do. Um, so I decided that I will use that privilege that I have um, to raise awareness about this war in the way that I can, that I know, and to, and to keep raising that awareness. So the first one is by Serhii Jadan. It's um, uh, probably one of the most famous writers in Ukraine at the moment and is called uh, The Orphanage. Uh, then there's also a book by Andrei Kurkov um, and it's called Grey Bees. Um, it's a lovely book, very different in terms of style, but also describes this kind of civilian. Uh, and both of these are translated into English. And there's one that hasn't been translated into English yet, and that's Olena Stashkina's In God's Language. Um, parts of that book are translated, uh, and hopefully the rest will be as well. Um, yeah, if you have a chance, take a look at them, they're wonderful. Uh, British views, <laughs> very painful subject. Uh, I want to feel optimistic and 
the optimism comes from the recent reaction of not just people in Britain, but leaders all over the world um, speaking in more or less united voice about the current potential escalation in eastern Ukraine and making it clear that um, they will not tolerate any further violation of international law. That's hopeful. Um, I really hope that it's not just words and deep concern. You know, Ukrainians have they can't bear to hear that phrase anymore. You know, the Western leaders um, express their deep concern because it feels so meaningless. Um, but th there will be, if, if necessary, action um, and that they will continue to stand united and send a very clear message that um, violation of another sovereign uh, state's territory um, is unacceptable. Um, do people know enough about Ukraine um, in the UK? No, but I don't blame them. Um, does Ukraine talk enough about itself? Sometimes we try and sometimes we don't, because I think it's not just about communicating what's happening at the front line, it's explaining about the country as a whole and is really what we're trying to do in the Institute. Um, it's talking about literature, it's talking about culture, it's bringing good films to show to British audiences. It's making sure that literature is translated into English. Um, yeah, so I guess both Ukrainians in Ukraine and here and British public need a, to do a lot more work to get to know each other better. Um, but yeah, I would like to stay hopeful for now. The language question. I'm so glad you asked. I wrote all of it in English. I find it easier to write in English, possibly because that is the language I work in and have been for the last 20 years, but possibly because it gives me a little bit of distance. Um, and I'm really grateful to Sasha Dovzhik who offered a lot of comments and everybody in the uh, acknowledgements listed there, they truly did offer so much of their time and thoughts and ideas. And all of that obviously influenced um, the narrative, which I kept changing moving around it was difficult to structure because it was so fragmented and I didn't want it to be entirely fragmented I wanted it to make sense um, but I did have an absolutely amazing copy editor um, whose identity I didn't even know until a couple of weeks ago um, it was someone uh, who works for the uh, publisher um, uh, and I've never had such a wonderful relationship with a copy editor before. It was just such a joy to get the comments. They were thoughtful, they were sensitive, and they were just wonderful. So. Um, the reception, um, like I said, there's only been one review so far, and that came out today, and it's in Vox Ukraine, and it's in both languages, in Eng English and Ukrainian. Um, but um, I'm hoping to see some other reviews as well. Um, so far, I've been interviewed a few times and that's great. I didn't seek those opportunities, they just presented themselves, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and the great thing is that people write to me uh, a lot, uh, directly, and say I've read your book and this is what I thought about it. And this is these are people who um, I've never met in my life, they just find my email address on my website and share some very personal experiences. Th these are people who have nothing to do with Ukraine. Um, but they will share experiences and say, such and such chapter really spoke to my experience of this and this to do with grief. And I feel so moved by that, that the text resonates with people because that's exactly what I was hoping to achieve, that through universal ideas, thoughts, problems such as grief, uh, loss and so on, I will be able to maybe communicate this really complex story about the war in Ukraine that is so hard to understand for people who don't have a uh, nuanced knowledge of the country and the political situation there. So, so far the reception has been very nice. I <laughs> um, really hope it lasts. <laughs> um, uh, and like I said, it hasn't been published in Ukrainian yet. I wonder how it's going to be received in Ukrainian. I'm a little bit nervous that, you know, this is someone not from Ukraine talking about the war in Ukraine. It might be perceived um, in a particular light because of that, what right do you have to talk about your pain you live in London? <laughs> um, um, some of the essays, like I mentioned, were published in, in Ukrainian and received, had good reception. I, at least people who didn't like it didn't tell me so. <laughs>
um, and the play. Uh, no, I, we don't play. They plan to uh, perform it again, um, partly because we sort of shelved it. We'd we were going to perform four days after the first lockdown was announced, but that was the un the last performance that we planned. We decided that it was um, time to stop. Um, you can watch the recording of the version with the videos on YouTube. You can find it on our website. It's moloditeater.com. Um, and yeah, I guess it's just had its life. Um, yeah, if someone wants to take it on, please feel free. I'll send you the I'll send you the script, but I don't intend to do it. The researching more quite a while ago when I was still doing my MA and then moved on with uh, that subject to do my PhD. Um, and like most things in my life, it was by accident. Um, I was very lucky to have discovered well, when when I was writing my MA, I didn't know what to write it on. It was just after the uh, Orange Revolution. Um, and I didn't want to write about Orange Revolution and my um, supervisors in Oxford and St. Anthony's were encouraging me to write about Russia's foreign policy towards Ukraine and I didn't want to write about Russia's foreign policy towards Ukraine. Uh, and I was talking to a friend and, and a senior colleague, Marta Kala about it and just moaning. I said, I don't know what to write my dissertation on. And she said, actually, my husband, Roman Kravets, wants to talk to you about something. And he did, um, and it changed my life. He um, pointed out that um, the 70 year rule of classified documents in the National Archives in the UK um, expired when it came to um, the documents about the Ukrainian Waffen SS Galicia division. Right? And I was like, well, all right, I'll go to the archives. <laughs> what a fun thing to do. I went to the archives, I started to look at them. I knew nothing about the Galicia division. I had no family connection to them at all, which was probably a blessing. Um, because I didn't come with any preconceived ideas about it. Uh, and I started researching and it blew my mind. I wasn't going to be an academic, but I realized there's so much to study that I want to take it to a PhD. So then it became a book. Um, uh, so I wrote about the kind of post-war, but also a bit of war history um, to do with collaboration during the Second World War. Um, and because I got familiar with the Second World War, I also thought that when it came to doing a postdoc project, I thought, well, it's such a male world, it, it surely can't be like that. I mean, like we said earlier, but I didn't think it at the time. I mean, it's going to be more than just um, warfare guns and so on. Um, and so I started to research gender, uh, but still in the context of uh, military formations. So participation of women in a variety of military formations, the Red Army, UPA, uh, I also looked at some other formations a little bit, so regular and irregular and seeing how that um, differs uh, to male experience, uh, but also how being in a regular formation differs, to, differs from being in an irregular formation in an underground army. Um, and the, some of the findings were frightening. Uh, I sort of realized that I, you're a woman first and foremost, and then you're a soldier, and then you might be perceived as someone of a certain rank, and then um, of particular ideological position and so on. But your gender plays an absolutely crucial role in your experience of warfare, uh, especially as a service woman. And I'm going to stop in a minute because I can talk about this for hours and you all want a glass of wine. But uh, when Maidan started, uh, I looked at gender on the Maidan and then moved on to researching gen gender um, or service women's experiences in the war in Donbass. And I went to interview them, some of these women who fought in the Ukrainian armed forces or volunteer battalions as well. And I decided I'm going to ask them the same questions I ask the Second World War veterans and see what answers they give. And they gave more or less the same answers <laughs> about discrimination, about the lack of clothes that fit women properly, shoes, uh, underwear, um, about conditions at the front line where there's no um, even any proper concept of the fact that women soldiers might be there, um, no provisions about um, instrumentalization of their resource. Um, so being at the front semi-legally or illegally, being expected to do the duties of a service person, fighting, doing whatever you're supposed to do professionally, but also caring duties, so also being expected to cook, to clean, to um, and experience a lot of uh, sexual and gender-based violence 
from your own men, not to mention the potential violence from the enemy. So that was very sad and I was really glad to see that there was a beautiful movement of uh, veterans but also scholars growing who were addressing these very problems in Ukraine and it's changing and it's really good to see that it's changing. Legislation is changing, um, attitudes are changing, um, women themselves, these veterans now are educating themselves, educating others about their rights um, and, and possibilities about future study and so on. I actually talk about some of that in that book because um, one of the characters of the book is Maria Berlinska who, uh, uh, who played a very important part of, in my life um, um, in this whole story of the loss of Volodya but who's also a very famous volunteer uh, and a service woman herself in Ukraine. Uh, so yeah, this is also where my academic and my personal life merged very uh, closely.